Hi, my name is Anthony Stokes. I'm the writer and creator of Intrusive Thoughts. I have a YouTube channel named Super Comic Book Bros. You're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented and creative person. He's been on the show before talking about an amazing series called DK. You have to watch that interview because it was an amazing experience. And we are joined by a talented creator who not only has a new YouTube channel, which you should also subscribe to, as well as a brand new Kickstarter campaign with an incredible comic that I just happened to have read now called Intrusive Thought. Joined today by the marketing genius and the ever-talented Anthony Stokes. How are you doing today? Marketing genius, you are too kind. <laughs> well, hey, I, I'm going to pick your brain about the marketing side of things because, hey, we always need to know how to market in this day and age. But how you been, man? I've been fan. I'm, I'm tired. I'm exhausted, frankly. <laughs> like I'm so this campaign, this campaign, I'm taking a not insignificant break. <laughs> but you know, everything, everything's going good, man. I feel like well, you never know to hit launch, but I feel like I've made a lot of strides in my career, which is a good feeling. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Absolutely. So I'm a comic book creator. I think what I bring here is I, I think I just have a unique perspective. And I really just when I come onto a show, I want to make the best interview possible. That's my main concern, because if it's a bad interview, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help me. So I think that's something I strive for. And what project are we bringing to the show? Intrusive thoughts. Oh, that's what you, you must yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> intrusive thoughts issue one and it's about i'm bad at it but you know marketing genius over here <laughs> it is a supernatural mystery thriller it is about a teenager he's adopted he's an orphan and he has night terror sleep paralysis he's in a really bad place and then his sleep paralysis demon bites one of his classmates so it's like uh it's like a mystery essentially i'm way better than velma i'm sure yeah <laughs> Oh, you saw that video? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that as well. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a YouTube channel. What is the title called and what is it all about? It's called the Super Comic Bros. We do live streams. We're going to do shorts. We're going to do video essays. We're going to do all, all kinds of stuff. And I think the, the best part is when we have a creator on, I think of a topic and then I get the creator that I think best fits that topic. You know, And I think that is really going to bring out that creator's personality and expertise. So if I was on your show, what topic would you give me? Bro, you you always asking these damn <laughs> hard ass hard ass questions. I don't got to answer for you right now, bro. I can't, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm too tired right now. We have you on, though, bro. I, I've known you for a little bit, and from the short time I've known you, I love the fact that you have a, an amazing writing style. You have very intriguing characters as well, too. You bring a, a wonderful perspective to, in, in terms of DK, you brought death into the forefront. You brought an amazing story with that. And I can't wait to see your other issues as well in that regard. And now with intrusive thoughts, you're doing something that I don't think a lot of people talk about, or if they do, they don't bring your perspective to it with intrusive thoughts. Why is mental health such a taboo topic sometimes in comics? I think it's hard. I think it's hard to execute, right? I think it's hard to execute because it's not a, it's not necessarily a visual thing. It's a visual medium, right? So maybe you overshoot. Maybe it's just a subplot. Gideon Falls, for instance, I, I would say that's about mental health, but it's also about so much other stuff. So maybe it's not at the forefront of the conversation. Me personally, I wanted to make a comic that was about mental health, where like mental health isn't a phrase. You know, I, I try to I try to be as subtle as possible as well, and I also try to use visual language that communicates these ideas as well. You know, it was it was a lot of thought to make you know make it visual because that's it's a it's a visual medium. It's only a visual medium. So how's the campaign been so far? You know, what has been the reaction to the comic online? It's been good, man. It's been really good reaction, which which always feels great. You know, people were saying it's something different, which is, you know, the number one thing. People are saying it's really well executed. The art is good. Uh, the reception has been glowing. I, I like nothing sticks out of my mind as a negative review. You decided to start a YouTube channel this mm -hmm. year, but almost a year since we've last talked actually too. So, yeah. so why the need to create a YouTube channel? What has been ruminating in your head to showcase to the world? So, so essentially, I didn't want to depend on any promotional channels, right? You know, I like coming on here. I didn't do any promo for uh, Decay Issue 3, so that's why I didn't pop up. I was I was so tired. The more promotional channels, the better, right? That's the first thing. It's important for the ecosystem. That's that's a part of it. You have somewhere to go promote. And if some of these go away, then we're, we're screwed. We're, we're not going to be able to get to our audiences easily. So that's one. Two, I love talking about movies. I love talking about comics. I love talking about TV shows. And it's just a way for me. Otherwise, I'll pace around my house and talk to myself. So I, that's what I do. I just pace around my, my house, talk to myself, and I have a mic in my hand. And it's just, just utter into a mic. And then I get these opinions out. Three, I really love content creation. That's something that also people talk about. Like some criticisms I've got is that 
I'm more concerned about having a following and more concerned about having a personality or being a content creator as opposed to making comics. But to me, one, comics are content specifically. And, and B, my host Chris said this, it's a post-post viral world. Like you see all these artists that go viral. Like Doja Cat got famous from a song called I'm a Cow. Like if you remember that. And now yeah. she's a major artist. One Punch Man, I feel like is something that it was a meme, you know, memes, memes can propel your career. And like, to me, I just wanted to skip the line, you know, like, and truthfully to me, content creation, people think I want to be a comic book creator full time, like professional. I mean, it sounds good, but it also sounds really stressful, but content creation, like making video essays, doing, doing live shows and other stuff that seems like a lot more sustainable in addition to the, to the comic book. I think this is a step towards me trying to make a full-time career in comics. And I also just love it. I love content creation and being, and being an internet personality. But it's also providing value. And, and if you see people like Gary Vee, or if you see other people that have built up a career promoting social media before social media became popular mm -hmm. and showcasing what content should be created and how to format it and how to provide value to the people that you're trying to reach, which is always the hardest part because you only have like five seconds to find someone and get their attention yeah if you can provide that value to someone then that's why shorts i think took off for the best because you're just giving bite-sized tight information to people that just don't have time to listen to an hour <laughs> interview like some other shows that i know of that used to you know not bother editing so it's really comes down to what are you providing are people enjoying it and especially from your more recent videos essays i should say there seem to be really enjoying it or they seem to be very decisive about it how's that going man i ain't going to lie you're talking about the velma video so <laughs> yeah yeah. Don't know. I had a Velma Vito pop off. He has 11K views. At the time, at the time this comes out, it might have like 20K. We'll see. <laughs> actually, I think people really enjoyed it. It actually had like a 97% like to dislike ratio. People actually liked that one a lot. Now, my other opinions are a lot more divisive. And I think the thing about a video essay, the beauty of it is you mentioned Twitter space and we'll circle back is you get the, you're allowed the nuance, you know, Twitter, you only has a hundred, you have 140, whatever you have, you don't have enough characters to have nuance. And that's so much of the problem is people are like, yeah, you know, if I'm like, oh, something is trash. Well, it's like, you know what? Sometimes something is not worth the monologue. Sometimes the soliloquy isn't necessary. It's just trash. Sorry. Sorry that you want like a, a Shakespeare monologue. I'm not giving you one. It's trash. But what I like about the video essays is that you can really build your point and weave a narrative throughout a video essay. I don't think it was divisive. I think people actually understood where I was coming from. If you disagreed, I, I think I made some good points. Doing something that you're passionate about, putting something together and showcasing it to, to the world because something will hit and you never know what will actually hit. When it comes to conversations, amazing to see that the spaces that are currently available on, on the Bird Network there are a really interesting way to reach an amazing amount of audience. And in real time, I may try a Twitter space in the future, but I, I'm enjoying possibly popping into yours on occasion because you have some interesting conversations uh, to say the least. Like to me, I, I watch a lot of sports. So something that's a, a big thing is competitive advantage. Like what are the little things you can do to get above the competition? And for me, hopping into Twitter space and getting better at comics, I would say, and you read Decay to Intrude to Thoughts. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you later, we can circle back, but I feel like I got immensely better at making comic books. I get immense, I get so much feedback. I give other people feedback. You're growing, you're meeting new people. Your network is growing. The fact that I'm doing that, and it's very few combo creators that are doing that, it's just going to give me a massive competitive advantage. If you want to be hop in a space to talk about comic books, it's probably going to be one of my spaces. And frankly, it does take skill to host one of these things. And also we've built such a culture after doing this for probably less than a year. We feel a massive culture, like of 100 people plus that would, would come into the Twitter spaces that now when we do YouTube, we already have an audience that's going to pop in and spend at least 10 people just hanging around. It's just an underutilized thing. Why wouldn't you use every tool to your advantage? It just, it just doesn't make sense to me. I think it's a time factor as well, too. Like you have, to set it, you have to set it, you have to set it for part sometime to yeah. do an hour show or do an hour space or whatever, and along with editing and your essays, along with putting together your comic book, along to with promoting your campaign, et cetera. I mean, do you sleep? Not well, but you know, I got off, I got melatonin now. And so I'm doing a lot better. Well, first off, no wife and kids, you know, oh, yeah, that, um, helps, yeah. <laughs> that helps for me. It's just, I always want to feel like I'm working on comics. I always want to feel like I'm working towards getting better and being, becoming a, a better creator. And to me, hopping in a Twitter space, most of the time, like some people be in their drawing, right? Some people be in a drawing. Most of the time, I'm just chilling. I'm just playing 2K half the time. <laughs> I'm playing some video game I can half pay attention to. And I'm just, I'm just chilling. But it ends up working out so that 
while I'm chilling and getting close with my friends, getting better at making comic books. I am marketing. I am talking about my comic book. People are going to hop in and they're going to like, oh, you know, this, they, I mean, they might hate me, but like, normally they're like, I like this guy. Let me see what he's working on. Mm -hmm. All this other stuff. I do not like talking about my comic in a direct way. I like talking about it, the process from like more of a macro perspective. Mm. So how do we get here? What decisions do we make to lead here? What was the production like and stuff like that? That is marketing for me. So no, I, I'm just obsessive. I really, I really just want to be great <laughs> and, and doing a Twitter space is helps. Yeah. Use all the tools you have advantage of. If I wanted to stream the show on Twitch or something, I'd be doing that. I mean, I brought back the podcast this year after 14 years. Like mm -hmm. I, I needed to do something where like the space is there. They could listen to past interviews and maybe gain some experience and knowledge from past creators. You got to showcase all of uh, the content that you have. Absolutely. Intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that we're finally circling back, it's, it's amazing. Comic. The colors are amazing on it. The story is very tight. I think it's something that I'd love to see more of if you happen to make a second issue or this is just a one-off. Speaking of which, is it a one-off or are you making another? It's going to be six issues in, in, in my head. I'm regretting um, not putting next up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and I didn't put issue one on there anywhere. So that's on me. I'm still new. I'm still learning. Now that I know it's six issues, that makes me more intrigued. What was the hardest part that you wrote and what was the hardest part for your artist to draw? I really couldn't tell you because my artist is like a veteran, you know, he's been doing this for a long time. So he didn't really communicate any part that was like particularly hard. I'm not entirely sure. As far as writing, writing is my favorite part. That's the easy part for me. So I, I can't even associate a part that I wrote with being hard. Because once you write the script, it's, it's what, did, what did it say? Climbing uphill, you know? So it's like, I, can't, I couldn't even tell you. I can tell you the easiest scene to write was when he's walking up to the house. There's like a, you can see a smile or a face in the background. That was one of the, probably somewhere from page 10 to 14. I forgot. How long do we have? What are some of your stretch goals? No, so it's actually in pre-launch. So launch is on the 24th. What I do know is that these covers, I have a lot of covers and the covers are going to be, are fantastic. I'm, that's the main draw for me for this campaign is the covers. I wanted to try, you know, and variant covers are a way to really get more money from the consumer, which sounds bad, but you know, that's what we're doing here. You know, what else are we doing? So I would say definitely check out the covers. That's the main thing. And you know, the, the comic is good too. Who is the artist that has worked on uh, Intrusive Thoughts with you? DNS, uh, he did a couple of variant covers with me. So I had a familiarity with me. And then, so I tweeted about looking for an artist and then he was like, what about me? And then, and so we got started. So we already had a working relationship going back to April of la last year. Yeah. What type of style does he bring that makes intrusive thoughts so amazing? It's kind of gothic, almost paint like quality. It's just different. It's like a little funky, almost like a Tim Burton esque, mm -hmm. just like a dark, whimsy. I mean, I've gotten Sandman comparisons, which, uh, thank you. I I'll take those for sure. I do think it is kind of, he's got versatile style, but that's what I brought here is like kind of this fantastical, you know, it deals with real things, but it's a little bit extra, it's a little bit extra, a little bit off from reality. So what did you learn about yourself in terms of writing this comic? Then? I learned that making two concurrent series is very hard. <laughs> It's good practice. I kind of put too much on my plate, but it's good to learn because like for me, I want to be a, I want to be a writer. Like I said, talking about your advantages, one of the advantages a writer has is we can work on concurrent projects. Whereas a, a artist, I mean, they could conceivably, but it'd be a lot harder. So for me, I'm working on three different series right now, but this is something I might have to get accustomed to if I do try to make a career in being a comic book writer. Full time. Can you hint at the series that you're working on? Well, this one is Decay. So Decay is almost done. De yeah. Decay, we're on issue five, like page six. So we have 18 more pages of that. Very, very exciting. Because then we get the trade, you know what I'm saying? I get the omnibus, you know. I have another comic book called God I Wish the Gods Were Dead, which is going to be an anime. It's going to be like a fantasy anime. It's going to be, it's going to be excellent. And then, of course, Intrusive Thoughts is your other series as well, too, here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Being a, a content creator, what are the highs and lows about your profession? Getting good reception, and reception could be like, this is good. It could be Kickstarter, <laughs> Kickstarter <laughs> pledges as well. Like, I had this Velma video that I got mentioned popped off, and it got 10K, and that's like my first video essay on this channel. I tried to be a YouTuber like four times in my life, so I finally felt like, okay, this is, this is it. Anytime you get money, I'm not going to lie, because it's, it's an expensive. People don't like talking about that. People like like making this, making this shit is free. It's not free. It's very expensive. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like that's not a relief. Cause once you get the, the money, you can make more stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like if intrusive thoughts pops off, then, oh my God, this is sustainable. I can make more comics. I can make four series, you know? So getting money, that's the best part. <laughs> We've kind of been dancing around a bunch of different issues here and controversy is always an interesting terminology and, and you're not a content creator without 
controversy. How have you survived and how do you deal with controversial, not only topics, but issues? You know, the funny thing is controversial is so subjective. One thing can be controversial to another person and then it could not be. To me, it's just like if something bothers you, that doesn't necessarily make it controversial, right? One of my most controversial posts, like the one that I got the most flack for, I think I lost Kickstarter backers. I think I, I lost a lot of followers was I said, marketing is a comic book making skill. To some people, that's a controversial statement. To me, it's like damn near common sense. How I often react is like, to me, when I got on Twitter, when I when I started making comic books, really, and I started taking it seriously, I was like, I want to be a name. I want to be somebody that indistinguishable from the comic book space. And honestly, I feel like I haven't done a bad job. Like, I feel like if you say Stokes, people will know who that is, you know? I just go with it, you know what I'm saying? I'm just going to give my opinion. I'm going to respect everybody. I'm going to respect everybody's culture. You know, I make an incl- inclusive space, but I might be not, I might not agree all the time, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, for me, it's just like, whatever. If, if a post blows up, people don't like it, whatever. That just means more people are going to see me on their timeline. If we agreed with everyone in the entire world, I mean, sure, we'd have world peace, but I mean, what's the point of living? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you got to think about we're writers, right? You're like, what's the driving force of a story? It's conflict. We got to disagree. You know, we're going to disagree. That's fine. We, we can find the best way. But pointing to somebody and saying, oh, you're wrong because somebody might not like this is crazy. And like, let's be clear that the controversial statements that I'm a part of are just like hot takes or things that people, like I said, people don't agree with. And I think, unfortunately, the community, for lack of a better word, is extremely soft. I think unable of having difficult conversations, conversations that could help the community. I'll ask a question. I, I asked, would you rather be successful? working mainly through a company or mainly independently. People said, why not both? Some of them answered the question and some of them couldn't. It's like, why not both? Why would that be important? It's important because depending on your answer, you might want to make certain decisions, right? If you want to get independent, should invest in Kickstarter. You should very much and in, in focus on trying to get the best Kickstarter. If you want to go to a publisher, for instance, you better learn how to make a pitch pack. You should be make as many ideas as possible. You should make a bunch of scripts. You should make a big artist portfolio because these are two different goals. And the fact that you can't even identify what kind of career you want to have, that's embarrassing. Because <laughs> I know which one I'm picking. Give me the studio. Give me image. Give me boom. I want the clout. I want the exposure. You know what I mean? Like I said, I don't feel like that's controversial. I feel like it's only controversial if you're a baby. Don't cut that one. <laughs> no, no, no. I saw you want that as a, one of the TikTok things? Yeah, please. <laughs> please, and then send it to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I'll post it on my TikTok and you can link back to it if you want. Absolutely, absolutely. Or use it in one of your video essays. That'll work. That'll be even better. I'm with like it. That. I'm yeah. with it. See, and this is how collaborations start, you know? <laughs> is there anything I've touched on you want to talk about before I wrap up? I was wondering what you thought. Like, did you see the improvements from Decay to Intrusive Thoughts? Because Decay was my first comic book, and I think this would be my fourth issue, Intrusive Thoughts. Maybe even second. No, my second, actually. Because I think I've only seen issues one and two of Decay. Mm-hmm. Okay, just just so I'm clear on on your progression. I think you're you're writing, and this is the, one of the main things I've noticed is your writing is a lot tighter. Mm-hmm. Like your flow is a lot better in intrusive thoughts than I think DK one for sure. I, I know for sure there, there's a good transition between those two points. I think the visual storytelling you're going for, and it does help with your artist as well too. But your visual storytelling in intrusive thoughts is way better than what you put together with day decay two because i saw i was seeing a progression in dk2 but i like i said if i see dk3 i'm sure i could see uh, an improvement you're improving is what i'm trying to say you're continuously improving so it's not like you're you're regressing or you're falling back on old habits or old verbiage or anything like that so i think you're doing great that way um, i think these spaces and your channel are helping you even more because now you're finding your voice and i think that's something that you're getting to in dk1 mm-hmm but you're solidifying yourself now. And that's the main thing. Like I didn't find my voice in this show for five years. Yeah. I, I didn't know myself enough to really put myself out there more, more so. You ever find or ever, ever listen to any of the old stuff in 2008? I was severely introverted. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still am, but I hide it very well. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So keep doing what you're doing. Your voice will only get stronger as you improve yourself. And this isn't even in regards to being successful. Once you find your voice, once you find and make your own platform as you are, you can only get better and stronger and faster and whatever that other uh, Daft Punk song is. Now you got to listen to it. Better, I think. I think you missed better, better, stronger, faster. 
It's interesting you say that, right? Because I think, because this could be kind of interesting. So I think the pitfalls that a lot of creators get into is that they're too married to their ideas, right? I get often get asked, do you have a passion project? And I don't, I really do not have a passion project. I, I really love all of them. And I think the pitfalls of having a passion project is you can't be too attached, right? Like my goal is to be a storyteller. I don't want to tell just one story. I want to tell as many as possible. I think anything can happen. It's not guaranteed that you're going to be able to keep making this series or that series. Anything can happen. I try not to have a passion project, take a back of a look at things we have people like when their first comic is trying to be like some epic it's just like okay bro i understand but you haven't even made the first one yet which sounds insulting and i I didn't like the advice when i heard it but i was like you know what i'm gonna listen so decay one through five i don't even think it represented my full writing ability when i wrote it but i wanted something that one i could complete within two years a five issue series that was important it was a simple thing that i could explain quickly that i can get the ideas across really quickly and something that was very striking that I can give it to anybody, something very digestible so that I can give it to anybody. Like I pride myself on being able to sell to non-comic book fans. I think a lot of my fan base doesn't read comics. You know, I wanted a grandmother to be able to pick up my comic and, and read it. That was a strategy and it worked. I don't disagree with you about the voice thing. That's what people say. That that's what they, oh, it's missing a voice. There's a time and a place. You ever seen a director do a movie and they have a distinct style and they kind of pull back? I think that's what it's like. Thank you. Intrusive Thoughts is more of like a heavy shift in the kind of the stuff that I'll be doing going forward. I think you're right. But that's fine though. I mean, it shows progression as a writer. If you look at Neil Gaiman's work. Mm-hmm. He doesn't stick to the same thing. He has a his style. You know, you know his style of writing. You know his style of creating. Same with any other writer. You know their voice. You know their work. They will fall on habits of old that have either worked for them or that they really enjoy. You know, different verbiage or different pauses or or different ways they've created characters or bringing characters into a scene. They have their own style. You see that in film too. If you look at Christopher Nolan's work from the Batman, but if you go back to his very first film, Memento, and you see, say, Interstellar, you see his ability to work with time and to work yeah. with character storylines with time factors in there as well too. While he's known for Batman, his real work is in how he interacts characters and their disassociation with time. So especially with intrusive thoughts, when you have your character dealing with the struggles that he's dealing with and and how his manifestations are now becoming physical, that's something that is, like you said, is very hard to tell visual, but you're doing it. And I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Because you read two of my series now. So I would say Nolan is really good with like plot structure mm-hmm. and uh, cinematic moments. What would you say my strengths are then since you read both? I think the way you care about your character, mm-hmm. that's the main thing. That's the one thing I really noticed with between DK and even with intrusive thoughts. While this character is struggling, you still care enough to showcase these struggles in the light that that Mm -hmm. you shine on. So I think, and I noticed this more so in DK, a lot of people when they do talking heads or when they have character interactions, it's very, this is a woman's point of view, this is a man's point of view. They don't go into the underlying effects of what their lives have been like. You did that well with DK. And mm-hmm. I noticed it more so in, in, in issue two. And I do want to read issues three through five, by the way, whenever you get to those. So oh, I wanna... three, three is out. Okay, then there you go. I, I'll have to pick it up. So I, I like seeing progression of character development. And that's what you're doing. If you can get me in the first two pages with character interaction, that makes you care about your main character, not just because he's the main, he or she is the main character. You have me hooked for a series. I don't care if it goes downhill <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> You still have to hook because I want to see the, I want to see your final goal. So keep your character development going the way you're doing. Yeah. And I think don't be afraid to do more cliffhangers because I think that that is something that is needed in a lot more writing these days. People are just very cookie cutter. Here's the start point. Here's the end point. And I'm going to make it up as I go along, but I want to see more distinction between why a choice is made and what are those consequences. Mm-hmm. in a character why did they choose to do what they did but they also had a choice to do something else if you can split or show a split different paths of a character in in talking then great yeah no you're right so i like to do bare bones i like to do like minimalistic stuff and what that does is it makes you very efficient right so you have two characters talking and i try to inject as much character as possible into these moments for instance you, you ingest in decay she's a mortician it looks like somebody's putting on their makeup but it looks like she's actually she's she's like hey we got to get your you know get the eyes get the mouth you know and then um, it reveals that she's talking to a corpse. I think that speaks a lot. That tells you about her job. It tells you that she's she's kind of morbid, but she's also like a really compassionate person. Like, I think that moment that lasted like two pages, for instance, tell, tells a lot. So I, think, I, would, I would agree. I would agree character building is a strength as well. You're just starting your career too. 
That's the other thing. Yeah. Like there's, there's so much more stories that you are going to create. Mm -hmm. and, and when you get to those stories, when you get to tell those stories and it resonates with people, no matter their backgrounds or no matter what your themes are, you know, as long as it, it reaches them in some way, shape or form, you know, you've succeeded as a writer. For those that are starting an epic as, as their first story, cool, but you didn't get to this point without learning from past mistakes and past experiences, which mm -hmm. makes you evolve not only as a writer, but as a person in whatever f entertainment field you happen to be in. As a content creator, as a YouTuber uh, that are bringing up comic essays or entertainment essays, you're showcasing your passion for what you do. You said you like film. You said you like comic. Those are two very thick fields of content currently. But if you can make your voice different from those that are out there if you can provide a point of view that is not anywhere else then you've succeeded even if your video hits 10,000 views or if it hits five views you've done something <laughs> right I'm like it's <laughs> a big drop off <laughs> It's a big chop off. No, 100%. That's a great point. That's an, that's an amazing point. See, people say be undeniable, but also be like irreplaceable. When somebody comes to you, something that they can only get from you mm -hmm. because then you'll, you'll have customers for life. That's, that's brilliantly put. We're kind of wrapping up here. So I, I do appreciate you coming on the show, Anthony. Coffee, you know, I, apparently I didn't turn on my coffee pot. So I would just have a cold coffee right now, which really sucks. But Oof. It, it's a good <laughs> coffee. Don't get me wrong. It's, but it's, it's like a cold press. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, God damn it. Anyhow, um, so we touched on your comics, we touched on your Kickstarter, touched on your artists, touched on your YouTube channel, spaces, controversy. I was curious your thoughts on that too, so that works out. I didn't want to name anything or anything like that. So you could have. <laughs> you what were you thinking? Okay, all right. Yeah, we could have. Uh, I could have, but honestly, it's like that. I think just the word controversy in itself will just be perfect for short video clips and all that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um what else, anything else you want to talk about or else I, I can, I can just wrap this up because you've already answered my four questions. So it's not really. Yeah, I think, I think we can wrap, man. I think this, I think this is really good. Tight, tight 40. All right. Sweet. Love it. Well, Anthony, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a good time. Tell us how we can find you and how can we can support you on the internet. I'm at Stokes right on Twitter. That is my main promotional platform. And then search Intrusive Thoughts on Kickstarter. I'm launching on January 24th. I'm feeling a little terrified. So, you know, make sure you uh, reward my hard work. All right. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person. Sue me which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And the podcast is finally back after 14 years. And the new place you can find this at is two geeks talking dot podbean dot com. And it's available on all of your famous streaming podcast services, except Apple iTunes, because that's linked to something else. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking.